Hello and welcome to Conversations in Clean Tech, the podcast that celebrates the clean tech industry and the people that power it, brought to you by Brightsmith. I'm your host, Jenny Gladman, and for this third season, I'm delighted to have a co-host on the podcast. I'm your co-host, Ben Sparks, and across the podcast, Jenny and I will be interviewing leaders, innovators, and forward thinkers and entrepreneurs from around the world to explore the opportunities, challenges, and rewards of working in clean tech. From transforming transport systems to accelerating the EV revolution. In this series, we'll be exploring the pioneering technology at the cutting edge of future mobility, helping to connect us in the cleaner, greener world of tomorrow. In addition to offering some tokens of wisdom to enlighten, engage and inspire everyone to live their purpose every single day. So we are proud to host today Marilyn Debio Luet from Black and Beach. Marilyn is a, a director of business development and transformation technologies, um, working across distributed infrastructure and clean transportation at Black and Beach. Marilyn's experienced business development career and is also a team manager within sales and strategic alliances, um, and has a track record of over 25 years in the clean tech. Uh, industry focused very heavily on the EV infrastructure and also uh, energy storage um, areas, which include electrification and hydrogen. Marilyn has uh, held a number of roles in the past, which really intrigued us to get to know a bit more about her and definitely comes from a non-traditional background as well. So Marilyn, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. Um, Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, So as Ben mentioned, I've been in the uh, sustainability and clean tech industry for about uh, 15 years out of 25 years of career, um, mostly focusing the last 10 years in uh, clean transportation. And so I'm right now a director of business development at a company called Black & Veatch, which is an engineering and construction company, a pretty large one in, in the United States uh, with international operation. And um, I focus on business development, sales, partnership for the company, specifically in uh, clean transportation. So I work on the EV space, uh, anything from uh, public public charging all the way to fleet um, electrification, as well as on the hydrogen technology market uh, with uh, fuel sales technology, buses, trucks, uh, medium to heavy duty uh, in hydrogen as well. So my uh, common thread uh, throughout my career has been in uh, in environment and social responsibility, uh, I would say. And uh, I think you wanted to know about my background even uh, early on, right, or how I ended up in, uh, in clean transportation. So <clears throat> as you can hear by my accent, um, I did study in France, not in the U.S. Um, I, uh, I have a major in economics and statistics like maths a lot, but I also like to write when um, uh, I also have a degree in journalism. So, and I believe that if I had stayed in a French speaking country, I probably would have become a journalist and not and not uh, in sales. But um, my life took me to the US and um, I first worked actually in the TV industry for, for about 10 years. And uh, that's what took me to the technology world um, because at that time uh, the internet was coming to the market, streaming media was coming to the market, and a lot of people from the TV and radio industry moved into that space. And uh, I ended up working with a, a company that uh, specialized in infrastructure for data centers and, and uh, data transportation, I would say. And uh, that's Akamai Technologies, and that's what took me into the uh, the the whole industry of technology in general. So, um, and then a couple of years later, I wanted to combine my my interest, which was always in uh, <clears throat> responsibility, like I said, social and environmental responsibilities. And I uh, went back to school, and I uh, I went. Uh, to do an MBA program in uh, 2004, um, basically in sustainability in San Francisco. And the final thing I would say, since I've been living in California for a very long time now, over 20 years, is that uh, it's a great fit for me because uh, I grew up near the Atlantic Ocean, um, so in France, 
And here being near the ocean has always been my passion. I sail, I am I'm a scuba diver, and um, I do a lot of things related to the ocean or a kayak too, for example. And um, I've always had a strong interest in the human impact of ocean and the water in general. Um, to try to contribute to to see what's happening uh, with all those changes as water is so vital in the uh, in the world. So that pretty much summarizes where I'm at, and I'm still in the Bay Area of San Francisco and enjoying it here beside the fires and the heat waves. Yeah, yeah, you've had a bit of a tough time. Um, so journalism, clean tech, and the ocean. I, I guess all of those allow you to kind of live live your live your passion. Um, I'm, I'm interested. What what first attracted you to, to journalism? I um, definitely loved uh, learning about different cultures. Uh, the geopolitics was very interesting to me. I like to write, and I was uh, my destiny. What I thought when I was uh, you know 16 to 18 years old uh, to um, to be uh, what we call in France a grand reporter, a great reporter, which uh, I wanted to go overseas. Uh, you know, write and report about. Uh, human or environmental issues uh, in the world. That was really my uh, my goal and my destiny. But I ended up um, not being able to do that because I moved to the US for personal reason. And uh, the challenge was, of course, to be able to write a report in English as well as I could do it in France. And then, as you can hear, I didn't do great progress in English. So <laughs> uh, it's not. <laughs> it's a career I was uh, just not as available for me by being in the US. Well, I appreciate that. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, um, so when we look at your profile, like I said, you've got you've you've lived your passion in, in, in a number of different areas. Um, we'll come on to clean tech specifically at the moment, but um, I'd love to know a bit more of a deeper dive into your current role and some of the work that you're currently doing in in, in clean transportation. So, um, first of all, we uh, the company has been um, uh, really developing strong program um, in uh, building infrastructure for transportation because there is an overall um, goal of tackling uh, the challenges of transportation. So, first, uh, the statistic: uh, twenty five percent of the green gas emission comes from transportation worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., even a little bit more in like urban environment, and we're talking about 28 to 30 percent of the of pollution of gas emission comes from transportation. Other countries, it's a little bit less. So it's a huge one to tackle when you look at uh, climate change issues. And um, Black and Beach has been committed very early on into I'm going to say clean technology in general. So our company uh, was uh, 30 or 40 years ago already involved in renewable. Um, the company built, you know, so solar farms, wind turbine farms uh, across North America. So we have a very strong electrical engineering, civil engineering, and even mechanical engineering at the company um, that provides uh, the expertise that we needed when EV and uh, hydrogen um, technology came into the market. So early on, um, the company... Um, I was even before my time, uh, uh, worked with Tesla as an example. We did some superchargers across the U.S. and Canada. And uh, since uh, we've worked even more on, on all public charging, and it's this is all DC charging, so it's a high-end uh, power, you know, output, and uh, you need a lot of expertise in that field. And since uh, Black & Veatch was also an expert in distributed infrastructure, uh, those are not big projects when you look at them one at a time, but we do hundreds of them, right? We deployed hubs all over the country, same in Canada, and it's now in some other countries. And uh, this expertise of scalability and being able to duplicate um, expertise in different areas and adapt to different areas um, is what Black & Veatch does uh, do very well. We, uh, for example, there's 3,000 utilities in the U.S. Every single one of them work in a different uh, capacity, has, has different requirements. So you need a lot of local expertise in order to develop those programs. And, and, um, and, and obviously that's one of the biggest sort of challenges, right? If you look at sort of the, the European model versus the U.S., it's kind of how you're navigating just such a, a large diversity of, of suppliers. Is that, is that correct? 
Yep, uh, and it's complex because uh, there's only a handful of companies that provide uh, the charging stations, for example, the OEM, a handful of companies that provide electrical equipment. So actually, most of them are European. It's Schneider Electric, Siemens, ABB. Um, I actually come from Schneider Electric myself. Before Black & Veatch, I was for um, six or seven years uh, in the EV space already with Schneider for the U.S. market. And um, so all the, uh, you know, switch gear, panel board, all this equipment is key and, and part of this uh, clean transportation uh, system. And currently, as we all know, there's major uh, uh, supplies, um, part supplies uh, issues and delay uh, for manufacturing of equipment. So that's delaying our program quite, quite a bit, not just us, just the whole industry. And same thing with um, the OEMs that are manufacturing uh, light duty to heavy duty, uh, you know, class six, class eight trucks, the buses. Uh, we are experiencing delays in the delivery of the uh, vehicles because of uh, also supply chain issues. So it's affecting the world right now. And we're seeing so much press around this, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act that, that's come out when looking at electrification and, and transportation. Um, you know, if you had to summarize some of the big ticket items that are going to really sort of benefit our race to, to, to net zero, what, what, do you, what do you think they are at the moment? Yeah, I would say it's two, twofold. One is about the choices that uh, the end customers as well as the business market has in this field. So the price has to go down. Um, we're actually seeing in North America a parity on pricing between uh, uh, the internal combustion transportation and the electric or hydrogen system. So um, now that the price is becoming almost, I'm going to say equal, uh, it allows to open the market. And then, of course, the choices of the models, <clears throat> more we have models um, and choices on the market, uh, easier will be. And then you still need uh, incentives at the governmental level and the policy needs to be right uh, and in place in order to help the adoption of uh, electrification. So the, the, the big um, turning point will be when fleets, uh, so cars is one thing, but when the fleet market is really able to, to switch, um, that's really when we're going to make a difference. And when I talked earlier about the uh, uh, zero gas emission goals, uh, you can only achieve those goals if you're able to um, to have the fleet completely change of a system that we currently have. In California, for example, um, the diesel uh, uh, technology is still very much in use and uh, we have a long way to go to, to change it. So, but uh, uh, I would say in Europe, uh, there's maybe a more um, standardization and incentive done among the different countries to make that happen. Here is more recent with the federal government, uh, but we have the example of California, which was really always very proactive with their uh, transportation policies and clean technology, and uh, it's working. We, we, we are, the adoption of uh, EVs is uh, fantastic here. We are like at 15% um, in Northern California, for example, and at 10% in Los Angeles area. So a long way to go, but you're you're seeing big jumps, which is which is which is fantastic. Um, so so I'd like to you know let, let let's go back in time a little bit. Um, the thing that we love about the the, the clean tech industry is that um, we we get to speak to people from different backgrounds, right? And also, you know, part of this podcast is about you know giving people and inspiring people to sort of make that leap from from other sectors. So. Um, you've been in the in the industry for for longer than most, um, even back to you know, even if we look at specifically EVs and, and and clean transportation. What are some of the 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 key points of your journey as you look back on that that really inspired you to sort of live your purpose at the moment? And I'm also thinking what what challenges did you have to overcome to to kind of get where you are today? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting because, like I mentioned earlier. Early on in my career, I was not in uh, clean technology, but there's two fold for me um, that brought me there. So first of all, early on, uh, our family was were always very much tuned into uh, uh, clean energy and clean technology the best we could. So I'll give you an example. Our family, uh, we've lived in three different homes um, the last 20 years. I'm going to say, or 25 years, and we um, we always had solar panels on our roof. So 
2002 was our first set of solar panels because uh, already in California, there are some good incentives, I have to say. Uh, it would have been expensive if there was no incentives, but there were incentives and we benefited from it. So there's been 20 years uh, now, when I think about it, when 2022, so uh, 20 years of um, being committed to the best we could, you know, with um, uh, solar energy, that's one example, and conserving water and things like that in the garden. And uh, I think when you... Um, uh, you can combine your personal interest with a career. It's the ideal world. So uh, in my personal case, um, I felt I was in technology at that time. I was with Akamai, but uh, Akamai technology was not a clean technology. It's a data center. So uh, it's actually pretty controversial <laughs> in terms of uh, usage of power. There's a lot of things to be done also in that space. And um, I, I decided to go back to school. And so I, I actually did this MBA in sustainability management. I was lucky to live at that time in the Bay Area of San Francisco. It was one of the first uh, green MBA program in the world and uh, with some very high quality um, uh, uh, professor in the faculty and the dean. And um, I realized, well, that would be my perfect world. I go back to school. I studied for an MBA in the U.S. Usually you do it in two years. 2006, I graduated. It's an accredited program that still exists. Uh, the school is called uh, a Presidio Grad School, Graduate School. And um, it's a very strong program. And uh, it really allowed me to combine my career with uh, my interest, my personal interest. And that, that's what gave me that leap into uh, clean technology, really. And in addition, in the U.S., um, something that doesn't exist so much in France is that uh, the networking in the school, the grad school environment uh, for higher education is incredible. And I always thought that, oh, maybe it's there, but didn't pay too much attention to it. But no, it's real. Uh, you become a, a, a part of the alumni uh, systems, of course, but uh, you stay in touch. There's always all kind of program to network and to help each other. Uh, with your career or, or mentoring, coaching. I speak at the faculty, for example, now just, you know, once in a while as a lecturer. And um, and it, it's very powerful. So never had any regret to uh, to go back to school. And it was interesting for me to also study in the U.S. in any case. It, it's really interesting. We, and it seems so simple, doesn't it? But that, that kind of networking piece and, 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 and setting yourself up is, is always really key. It seems to be a key theme that's coming out of a lot of the conversations we're having is, you know, your, your who you're surrounding yourself with and, and, and how you're collaborating with that network really sort of sends people on a, on a, on a trajectory. You know, looking back over, over those times, um, what would you say is maybe some of the, um, the challenges that you faced? And, you know, that can be either industry or, 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 you know, or personally? Um, so we reflect a lot on when we studied, which is now, you know, 15 years ago or so, uh, with what's happening now. And uh, because uh, 20 years ago, we already knew what was coming with climate change, for example, but uh, it's accelerating. So what's, I think, very concerning is what we predicted would maybe happen in 2000. 40, 2050 is happening at a much uh, faster pace now in the world, right? And um, so it's concerning. And then so myself, but also, you know, people in the industry, we consider that it's not changing fast enough. So those changes that um, technology helps with maybe are not ad adapted fast enough. So there is a cost, of course, issues uh, worldwide uh, that's challenging. You need to have access to this technology. But also, um, it goes back to a worldwide um, really understanding that, okay, some major shift needs to happen, and meaning that we need incentives to make it happen too, um, because uh, there are some communities who don't have access to, uh, you know, I talk about solar, it's great, to be, uh, could also afford it, right? Many people cannot afford it. Uh, so there's access to the technology. There are some communities that are more affected than others by the pollution. We have a good example in California um, between the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, which is one of the largest ports in the world uh, for importing you know, goods. Those goods are all going from Los Angeles to the Central Valley. It's not very far. We're talking of three or four hours of truck driving because there's not 
enough trains in the U.S. So you're talking of big trucks, you know, diesel trucks moving from the, the harbor all the way Central Valley. And they go through areas with uh, now a heavy, heavily polluted because of it. So those are major shifts that needs to happen. That's why it's so urgent to also talk about uh, medium to heavy duty uh, transportation and advance probably faster than, than we are. And of course, there is the issue of the size of the population, uh, population worldwide having access to a higher standard of living, but now it's provoking even more issues um, at the social and environmental level. So very complex, uh, I would say worrisome. So we, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, no, definitely. And, 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 and you know, what, what kind of keeps you, you know, in, engaged? You obviously feel like I get the feeling that this is as much of a personal mission for you as a, um, you know, as, 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 as a day-to-day business one. So, you know, what, what, what sort of drives you to sort of push yourself, you know, to, to embrace these complex challenges that we've, we've got? I would say so. Um, you know, we talked earlier about combining our special interest, uh, follow your passion. What is your calling? Mine is definitely uh, I'm extremely comfortable in in technology, but in clean tech, of course, to combine my goals. So, um, I think, um, yeah, following your 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 passion is um, is very important. That uh, is very satisfying. And I would say, for me personally, my second element, which that's why I enjoy working in California, is um, keep learning. I'm always learning new things. So six, seven years ago, I knew nothing about hydrogen technology. And now that came to the market. And now I'm fascinated. And frankly, uh, Europe is uh, more advanced than we are in North America with hydrogen. A lot of the companies that are in that field are uh, bringing their technology to the U.S. So uh, for me, it's fascinating, and I've learned a lot about it the last couple of years, and uh, it, it solved one of the problems in transportation. So it's complementary to EV. EV might be a little bit more to light to medium-duty transportation, and then hydrogen will tackle he- uh, medium to heavy duty. So we're talking about the trucks, perhaps the buses. It depends on their route, but it's also marine and the vessel uh, uh, industry uh, that's starting to look into hydrogen, the aviation as well. So small plane, uh, plane of uh, four to six people can maybe tackle uh, the electric uh, battery systems. But if you talk about um, larger cargo, um, you need to go probably uh, with your sales technology. So for me, that's fascinating. Um, I keep learning. I don't need to go back to school to do that. It's okay. I learn through the conferences we go to with all the engineering team I work with, of course, uh, that are experts and uh, also our clients. That's why I like sales, actually. Uh, maybe finishing with this is that um, I learn from the clients or when the clients are giving us challenges that are um, there's no answer into the market then it forces you to look for those uh, solutions. And um, so my job is very solution-oriented, more like uh, also it's consulting sales, I would call it, or educational sales. But when we don't know, well, we look for the information and we try to provide solution for the market. So for me, that's all fascinating. Indeed. And, and it, it's a nice segue, actually, because as we see people growing their careers within the industry, um, we're finding more and more people taking on what we'd call kind of like stretch opportunities, right? Where either there is a, a career move or it's a new problem or it's a new customer project that's probably, you know, it's probably a, a bit far ahead either from their current knowledge base or, or, or where they are in their career. And, and and that's just due to the nature of the, the industry growing so rapidly. If you look back over some of your kind of client engagements or career moves or maybe some of the, the challenges you've overcome in, in the marketplace, um, what would be one of those kind of stretch moments for you that you look back on and think, yeah, that, I, I grew then? Yeah, my stretch moments probably about the technology because I didn't have an engineering background. Um, I was comfortable in math and numbers in general, but this is different. Engineering is different. And um, I thought it might be challenging for me to be in that space, um, but my career brought me to that space uh, not by chance, of course, but I would say I didn't think I would be uh, selling, I'm going to say, technology solution. And uh, I am. And I did even with Schneider Electric before on the hardware side and software side. And um, we can learn. It sounds like we can 
always learn and never be afraid to try things because uh, those are knowledge that can be acquired. They're not, you know, innate. I mean, I work with people who study philosophy or sociology, and uh, they are in technology now, and they're, they're brilliant. But uh, because they, we don't need to be all engineers, because me, I learn from the engineers, and I, uh, I'm going to say, uh, translate what they say in technology terms into business terms. And you, you need that type of capacity too. So I think there's a fit for everybody. But uh, to not be afraid to, to learn new things because we adapt, uh, you know, humans adapt pretty well. And when we have the internal motivation to do so, uh, it works. It works very well, I think. Amazing. So obviously look into your, into your crystal ball um, to the future of, of, of the clean transportation market. Um, you mentioned fleets is a big ticket item. You know, I'd love to hear, you know, what you see, you know, <laughs> um, and it doesn't have to be accurate happening, um, you know, over the next few years and, and, and specifically maybe uh, if you can, where you see the work you're doing play into that. So what, what, what's next for the clean tech market? So I would say um, the, the trend right now for the adoption of this new technology is, is definitely happening. It's an exponential growth worldwide so in europe in north america but also we see the same in japan in korea in china and probably tomorrow in india and uh, latin america of course so i think people are convinced that uh, yes that's the right thing to do they want to do it they want to do it at the right price so that's why the parity uh, between the technology to be achieved is essential for me, the biggest concern I think I'm going to have uh, now is uh, for the OEMs to be able to deliver um, the equipment because we are, there's so many companies we know in the logistic uh, world, for example, who are ready to shift, but they don't have the, um, the, uh, the vehicles available. So there's a waiting list right now. Um, you know, p uh, companies, fleet operators and managers place orders to the OEMs but there's two, three, four, five years of, of uh, delay before they, uh, they acquired the, the equipment, the leasing or uh, purchase of the equipment. So it is a challenge. And I think uh, I see it as the biggest challenge to, to convert the fleet because the market is actually ready. So we need to possibly help uh, the, uh, the industry, the manufacturing process uh, the best we can to, to deliver. Because if they deliver in the market, companies like ours, uh, we have time to build the infrastructure. It takes us uh, from 12 months to 24 months to build infrastructure for a fleet, um, bus or trucks, whatever that is. Um, so it takes time, but it's okay. And then uh, there's no company who, who place an order of 50 trucks or 100 trucks and get it, you know, in six months. That doesn't exist in the market. So, so the delay works, but the delay is actually too long now. It's uh, we're talking of uh, delivering, um, yeah, the vehicles in more like three to four years. So there's a challenge. What are you What are you hearing from the OEM side that, that's happening to try and kind of close that gap? It's probably never going to close completely, but they well they're they're trying to find a solution it's uh, what we talked about earlier the supply chain issues material um the mining industry of course is a is a challenge uh, the slowdown in china because of covid we took uh, you know uh, hit uh, worldwide because of covid uh, in uh, the delay of the manufacturing because of it a lot of uh, parts and equipment, the chips are coming from China and Taiwan. So we, we, um, that's one of the big uh, struggle right now. Yeah. So, um, so what we'd love to, you know, tap into some of your, your wisdom in the sector as well, when it comes to, you know, inspiring others. So if you had to leave this with one final thought, what would your sort of clean transportation token of wisdom be? I would say simply uh, to follow your passion, follow your passion, follow your calling, because it makes our, our work so enjoyable, right? If you if you work in a field that you're passionate about, um, things are just easier. Because nothing is easy, so that makes it easier. Easier, yeah, it makes it more more enjoyable. And then you wake up in the morning and you're happy to say, oh, I'm going to work on this and this uh, today. And there's new things happening all the time. And I think for any industry, the same. You know, if you work in the food industry, uh, 
in design, in clothes, in you know the lean sustainability design. Now, uh, knowledge of the market is great. So there's so much um, new application that can be used. Um, if you have any interest in any of this industry to be more sustainable, the solution now on the market. So it's more of a applying what exists on the market to this new technology and tomorrow's technology and just uh, follow your passion. What, uh, if I was in food and wine, I would find my calling, right, in, in, in sustainability in that space as well. It would be the same. Wouldn't that be a lovely mix of, uh, of passions? <laughs> um. I, know, I know some people who do that. They're very happy, yes. I, I need to get more clients in that sector for sure. Um, <laughs> well, listen, uh, this has been great, Marilyn. Thank you very much for, for taking the time and, and, and sharing your story with us. I, um, um, I look forward to having you again as a guest on the show in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your time and um, have a great day. Thank you for listening to Conversation in Clean Tech, brought to you by Brightspeed. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, and leave a review. Every time you do so, it helps others find the show. For more information around how Brightsmith can help you build a sustainable future through identifying, attracting, and retaining diverse talent, head over to brightsmithgroup.com. Join us next time for more conversations in clean tech.